Hi everyone and welcome again to uh, another of the library virtual events. We are excited today. I'm I'm Cindy Oser of Hobby Memorial Library. We have Lee Green Thanner streaming, but we're excited because we have Professor Keaton Eric. He is with the Agricultural Science Department and he is going to do a really awesome event for us today on soil testing. So, um, and he said he's got enough material for uh, three hours, <laughs> but we're, we're not going to do three hours. So this should be really great and exciting. So I'm going to go ahead and let him take it away. Awesome. Well, thank you for that great introduction. Uh, I don't know if it's, it's soil testing is probably not the most exciting thing out there in the plant world, but it's probably one of the top two most important things we need to remember and try to keep going for our plants because that's part of why our plants get to live. And so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, uh, my PowerPoint presentation that I have going, and we're going to be moving a little around. Uh, can y'all see the PowerPoint? Give me a thumbs up on you alls side. Yes, right. we can see it. Okay, awesome. And so we're going to go through this. Uh, if you have a question, uh, feel free to put it in uh, whatever chat box you're looking at. Uh, just uh, and we'll we'll answer that question right then. Uh, and also there'll be some Q and A time at the end if something else pops up, maybe on a different topic, and I can see if I can answer it. Uh, I'm by far not. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm into plants. I'm into row crop plants, my, maybe not so much on the house plant side, but anything that we talk about today is applicable to any plant out there. Uh, and so just keep that in mind, whether I'm talking about in a landscape setting where we calculate everything on per thousand square feet, or if we're considering large, uh, large area mass area. So we're talking farm and ranch or we're talking uh, hundreds and hundreds of acres or tens, 20, 30 uh, acre areas, everything's still applicable to that. So it's, uh, it's all in relation to the area we're working with, but how do we feed our plants? That's a, that's a big question. Um, how do we do it effectively? Can we do it all the time? Absolutely. Will we be throwing money away? Probably. Uh, but how do we do that effectively is a, is a big question. So I think it's always great to start with what plants need. So plants need air, they need oxygen, uh, they need water, because that's what plants use to move nutrients throughout the plant up and down from the roots and they let some, some moisture out of the bottom side of their leaves and they need light for photosynthesis. Um, and then most plants uh, in most settings need soil. Now I put most of the time because if, if you've been if you're a plant enthusiast of any sort, you've always heard of aquaponics or hydroponics where basically we can grow plants without soil and basically just water as a medium transporting those, the nutrients to those actual plants. And so we're going to keep it very traditional today when we talk about um, what plants need and how we actually feed them. And we're going to go, we're going to talk about plants that are typ typically in soil settings. So just keep that in mind going forward. Uh, when we talk, when you talk hydroponics, aquaponics, that's a whole nother ball of wax that you kind of got to melt and mill through to, to be able to get um, meet your successes. And so when we talk about soil, soil is does a couple of things for us. Uh, it's a way for the plant to set root so it can elongate up above the surface, um, but it also holds water. It holds oxygen and nutrients. Now, water is kind of the one thing that people say, well, yes, soil takes, absorbs water. But oxygen is the one that's kind of out there. But if we look at soil, soil underneath a microscope or un underneath a really close observation is actually like a bunch of little bitty rocks for the most part. So it's kind of porous. And all those open pores, when water's not there, oxygen is there. And so the plant will pull oxygen out of the soil as well as from the leaf uh, that we see and we enjoy of, of our plants. And the third thing that soils hold for us and provide to the plant is nutrients. And that's really the big thing that we're worried about today um, within those three is the overall nutrient profile of the actual um, soil. 
And so of those nutrients out there, uh, this is a very short and somewhat abbreviated list. Uh, these are our macronutrients. And macronutrients, all macro really means is that's the big things. That's the things we need in large amounts. Now, we also have micronutrients which are the little bitty ones, the ones that we need very, very few small amounts of that in most cases, we don't, we don't have an issue because the soil has enough of them already to supply the plant for years and years and years. And some of those macronutrients uh, we can get from uh, old plants that, that die and we put back in as compost, things like that. So it's not really a huge concern. Um, when we're talking about the entry level side of this, but our macronutrients of the big proportions that we're really worried about are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And you might hear me refer to them as NPK. And those three are the ones that are the biggest. Now, nitrogen is by far the one nutrient that helps us realize that that plant can actually grow. Nitrogen helps that plant put on really big green leafy leaves. Uh, that's how our plants, uh, like if you're looking at a lawn situation, you want to make a lawn very, very much dark green. Nitrogen is what's going to get you there, uh, along with a little bit of iron, but for the most part, nitrogen would do that. And that's what, if you put a bunch of nitrogen down on your lawn, that means you really like to mow your grass because it's going to grow a ton of leaf and a ton of plant material out there. Now, phosphorus and potassium, they have different roles within the plant. The plant still needs them just for overall uh, stability of life, but phosphorus and potassium affect flowering or fruiting of certain plants. Uh, whether, whether you're talking maybe a tomato plant or you're talking maybe a great flower, they affect the roots and, and the flower of the plant. So they are kind of what we call the lower level of, the, what I call the lower level of the macronutrients because we need them in a lot smaller amount out there in the landscape. And some of them aren't necessarily, uh, we don't have to put out every year either. So that's what a soil test does for us. But nitrogen by far is the one nutrient that leaches through the soil profile the worst. And what I mean by leaches is when we, let's say we put fertilizer out uh, and we'll talk about what that is later, but you put, whatever fertilizer you buy at whatever store you frequent and you have you put water on top of it well what happens to that nitrogen well those those little bitty nitrogen pellets go in the soil profile they melt they go in they're going to feed that plant that plant's going to start taking it up and putting on green leaf well when we keep water in that plant all of those nitrogen particles are going to keep going further down in the soil profile and eventually that nitrogen is gonna be outside that soil profile to where that plant does not have any roots. And so that's the leaching effect that we typically see with nitrogen. Uh, phosphorus and potassium does not necessarily have that, that big of an issue, but nitrogen is, is very much uh, a leaching nutrient that we need to take, that we need to think about. Because when we talk about nitrogen and we apply it to uh, whatever whatever form of nitrogen, whether it's organic, so coming from a plant material or inorganic, meaning a more synthetic fertilizers, it's the one nutrient that we're always limited in. And because it's the one thing, it's the biggest need for the plant, and it's also the one nutrient that leaches through the soil profile so much. And so when we talk about those, we need to figure out how do we how do we know what our nutrients are? Right, you you can't just take a soil sample out of your hand. You can't go dig it up out of the soil and look at it and say, hey, you know what, what do I have here? Soil doesn't talk to us. It doesn't say, hey, you know what, I could use some more phosphorus today. What it does tell us is it says, you need to send me to a lab typically and, and analyze us. And so how do we collect that soil sample to where we get a great representation of the area we want to manage? And so we need some tools of the trade that we typically use for this. Now, this is there are things on the on the screen in front of you that are by far the most scientific things that a that a, a gardener can ever have. All right. Uh, if we look 
Uh, first thing on the list is a good clean bucket. And so you see a good uh, CTC colored bucket right there uh, that that we make sure it's really clean. Uh, maybe we rinse it out. If, it, if we put soap in it previously, rinse that soap out because that can alter our test. But we just want that bucket to be overall clean uh, because if we have any uh, products that may have residual in there that can affect our overall analysis of that plant of that soil whenever we collect that sample. And the next thing we need is a soil probe, which is that silver T handled thing uh, on uh, be on my left hand side of the screen. And that that's that's what most that's what some people use. Okay, that's a soil probe. I, I if you're just doing your yard. I wouldn't recommend you go do go buy one of those because you're going to use it once or twice a year. And what's the point in having something else laying around the house that you hardly ever use whenever you probably already have a, a garden spade or a shovel, uh, even that you see that little hand spade right there. That's something you could use in a garden setting where your soil is already good and fluff that we can dig a hole with. And I mean, if we think about it, that spade right there looks like a very technical high quality scientific apparatus for any uh, gardener to ever have. Um, so we don't have to think too much outside the box. We know that that's an appropriate tool for that. We just wanna make sure it's pretty clean for the most part, cause we've gotta remember we're still digging in dirt, but we want that to be pretty clean so we can get a good representation um, from the start of the soil sample. So once we get all our supplies in hand, uh, just a plain Jane bucket, uh, uh, got a good hand spade or a shovel right there, that that works out wonderful. And so, once you get those big things, well, you then you need a soil bag. Now, this can be very technical uh, through Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service. Uh, so your county extension office. They have soil bags typically that are available to you. Just contact them, see what it takes to come pick one up. Um, in my previous experience, they've typically been free. So just call them up and say, hey, can I get one of those soil bags? But guess what? We don't have to make that trip uh, to Lamb Passes or to Belton if we don't want to. Uh, maybe that's just on your, on your way through. But you just want a good clean bag of anything that will hold about two pounds of soil. And so, and that's what the soil lab typically needs. Uh, they just need two, two pounds overall. So what I've done before, um, I've taken a red solo cup. Uh, I've used a red solo cup. I've used a Ziploc bag. I've used um, saran wrap. If it was real muddy, I just kind of caked it all up and wrapped it up together and poked a few holes in it. So we could still breathe a little bit in transit because uh, they're gonna dry the sample down anyway when they get there, but just any any common thing that'll hold uh, that two pounds of soil. Now, remember, if you're gonna take multiple samples, we need to have multiple apparatuses to hold that, to hold that actual product. And so that's one thing that's very important. We remember that we have that available because you don't want that soil sample to get mixed up uh, through the process with, uh, you know, got mixed up with some compost. Well, then that's going to throw our sample off and things like that. So we want to make sure we have those that thing around. And the last thing we need is a submittal form uh, to the Texas A&M AgriLife uh, Soil and Forage Testing Lab. And so this is the laboratory, a scientific laboratory that that's all they do there. They test uh, some plant samples. Uh, forage samples for nutrient availability for livestock or they and they also do soil testing and they do a lot of different tests and we'll talk about some of those coming forward but that submittal form helps us at the beginning to get everything done and I got an example of one uh, coming up here in just a little bit but how do we collect that soil sample we got our scientific um, apparatuses, right? We have our, our fancy hand spade or a shovel. I got, we got a fancy bucket. Um, the first thing we want to do when we see an area, uh, we want to think about how we're going to collect the subsamples. We're going to take subsamples and make a whole sample out of that. And so 
what I always try to tell people to do is first thing we want to do is take that shovel or that spade and dig a dig a hole about six inches down. We want to discard that. So like the picture you see in the corner, uh, that shovel dug down in the soil uh, about six inches, and we're going to set that off to the side. Doesn't have you don't have to throw it over your shoulder. Uh, maybe maybe that's maybe that would be a good enjoyment and good workout for the day to dig that hole and throw it there. But some people like to fill that back in the hole. So maybe it doesn't create a divot for you to walk in or when you're using a push mower, that front tire on that push mower doesn't just fall in there and stop you come to a complete stop and your neighbor down the road is laughing at you because it was kind of a funny experience for them at least. But we want to set it off to the side. And then we now we have this pretty little hole that has a back, the back side of that hole has a great flat surface. Well, we want to take our shovel again and we want to insert that about one to two inches from the back side of the previous hole right behind it. And so we take a one to two inch slice from the back side of that first hole. And so when you take that slice, you're going to want to take that slice and put it in, put it in a bucket. And that's your first sub sample for your, that's going to make up your first big sample. And so it's, it's important to, to, to remember that that's not our, just our one sample. Uh, if we were to take just that one sample, that, what would that tell us? That would tell us in that exact one spot where you pulled that soil sample, what the nutrients are. Well, that doesn't really help us because we're trying to manage an area. You know, if we were going to put one specific plant in that one hole, that'd be a great opportunity for us. But that's not a, that's not most of the time. That's not our goal. Our goal is to manage an area so we get the best bang for our buck. Because if we start managing on a square inch or even a square foot basis, we would be busy, busy people. And so we can manage areas with soil testing. Uh, all right, Lee, you got a, got a question? Fire away. Um, Chris Erickson asked, aren't there kits readily available to test the nutrient levels in soil? Yep. And so there are. Uh, there are. You can go to any big box store um, or any home garden supply store, and they typically will have a kit that you can take off the shelf and take home and test your soil. And that'll tell you low, it'll tell you within a range of how much nutrients you need to put down. I typically don't recommend those. Um, not that they're a bad product, but when you send this soil sample off, this soil sample will tell you exactly what you need to do. So we can be a lot more precise with all of our nutrients, because when we over apply nutrients, we have the opportunity for them to wash down the street into our streams and can cause algae blooms and lakes and ponds uh, through that. So I like to be a little more precise, but yes, they are available out there um, to be able to do that for you. If that's, uh, if that's what you would like to do as a, as a homeowner, but yep, this is, this is just a different way to do it. Absolutely. I hope that answers your question. If not, fire another way and we'll jump on into it. But when we take that first subsample, we want to do that roughly six to 10 times within an area. And so what you see is a green block right there in front of you. Let's say that represents a yard. Okay. Um, and I want to take a subsample at every one of those star points. Okay. Randomized. Doesn't necessarily have to be in a grid system. Uh, you just want to do things um, that you get a great subsample. You don't want two ne right next to each other. You want a good representation over the entire area that you want to manage. Now, let's say in this one green area right here, we wanted to manage them different. Okay, we wanted to manage the left from the right. We maybe we had two different grass types in there. Well, we would just split that in half and we would collect uh, two samples. So we would do six to 10 subsamples of each side and create two different samples. We wouldn't mix them together. We would keep everything separate from there. And so that's very, uh, very important. And, and that's going to tell you how to manage them different. Even though the soil test may come back exactly the same, 
that's just good good info to have. And next time you know, well, I can manage them the same. But if we have different grass types, so in a yard setting, you could have zoysia, you could have uh, Bermuda grass, you could have uh, St. Augustine or carpet grass. And those all three of those plant species can be managed a little bit different for high level um, activities for that plant to grow. And so it's very, uh, it's kind of up to you on a, as a, as a owner or a property manager to say, what is my time? Tell me I can do, because we can take a lot, a lot of soil samples, but at the end of the day, are we really going to know the difference between, are we going to be able to put the time in to manage all those little bitty areas different? So maybe you have, you send a sample in for turf grass for your yard setting. Uh, then you send one in for your garden. Then you send one in for uh, like a vegetable garden. And then we send one in for maybe you have a, 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 a perennial plant area that uh, woody plants and how do we manage those? And so we can, we can get a little specialized on that aspect as well. So it's kind of whatever you as a land manager or property manager want to put into it to be able to hustle and have those plants uh, do really well. Now, so we take all those six samples, we mix them all together, and now that gives us that one sample. So we want to we want to replicate samples across multiple areas, manage them different. We just repeat the steps all over again uh, through it, um, and eventually it comes like an old hat, and you know exactly what to do, and you never have to worry about it again because it's stuck in your brain just like riding a bike, right? And once you learn how to ride a bike once, you're set for life. Maybe if you stumbled every once in a while, I know if I tried to get on a bike right now, it would be uh, pretty rough. It'd be pretty comical. I'd invite everybody to come watch, that's for sure. But in my experience, like I said before, I, I really prefer to send samples to the Texas A&M University Soil Water Testing Forage Lab. Now, there are a lot more scientific labs out there. Uh, this is the one that I'm probably the most familiar with that uh, that does a great job. Um, there are three and four PhD level, P PhD level scientists that work in this space. Um, they do a ton of research on soils, but they also do this service. And it, and it does have a little bit of, of a cost to it, but in my opinion, when you can send something in and they are very, very accurate on the amount of nutrients you need to put down to provide nutrients to our plants. So we don't over apply because when you over apply, I promise you, I know what you're doing. You're just laying dollar bills down on the ground and you're letting mother nature just wash them down the drain. That has a negative effect uh, that can have a negative effect down the road. So uh, here's a website address. Uh, so if you're uh, on your phone or you're on a computer somewhere, feel free to take a snapshot of that. Um, or if you just Google Texas A&M soil water testing lab or soil testing, 95% of the time you're going to, their website's going to pop up. Uh, and on that website, they have a lot of great information. Kind of got to go dig for some of it, but there is a ton of information out there for us to be able to, to be able to utilize and for us to do that. And so let's go uh, look at their website a little bit. Um, let me see if I can share my, all right. So you should be seeing, uh, hopefully it came through. This is the website for the Texas A&M Soil Water Forge Testing Laboratory. Um, if you can drop your samples off in College Station, or you can actually, if you're going that way, or you can drop it in the mail, uh, ship it to them. Their address is there on the bottom, just right here. Uh, depending on how you're going to ship it, Postal Service or FedEx, they got two different addresses that they use. But um, you just walk in this door right here, um, and you walk in, and typically there will be an attendant in there that will uh, look over your submittal form, which we'll talk about, and to be able to do, and to take that. now. I would, they've changed up their payment strategies a little bit on how you pay them for the service, but uh, just work through it. Um, they don't take cash. Remember, that's the biggest thing is they don't take cash. So uh, just be sure to note that because that kind of is a evolving door um, that just 
changes sometimes uh, according to procedure and policies. But what this lab is going to do, they have certain extraction methods that they have found to be that are research based that on how they actually extract that data, that that numerical value of how much nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium or iron or sulfur that are in your soils. And they they have scientific calculations that do that. And so that's why I kind of urge this over maybe that uh, home soil testing kit um, that you can use that you can buy uh, offline or online or anywhere, uh, maybe at a store here locally. So because they have so much time and effort in the, into it, as far as the research is far, it concerned, I think it's a very valuable number. Uh, especially for over applying and under applying. And so as we go back to the PowerPoint, make sure I stay on point. All right, having technical difficulties. Can y'all see my PowerPoint? Yes. Is that back to the PowerPoint now? No, yes. Okay. Let me. Can you unshare your screen and then go ahead and share it again, but grab your PowerPoint? Yes. Let's try that. There we go. I'll get this figured out eventually. Y'all see the PowerPoint now? There we go. All right. Awesome. Good yeah. deal. Sorry about the technical difficulties. I'll try not to screw up anymore. No problem. But that's a great link. Great. Lots of great information there uh, for you to be able to uh, to use. Um, and and they they make recommendations as far as your your test goes. So the biggest question is when you look at their soil submittal forms, there is a ton of, of submittal forms on there and they all have different uses for different industries uh, or aspects of the industry. And so what most people would use for landscapes, um, so we're talking home gardens, uh, home lawns, uh, perennial plant areas within their home. Typically they want, you would want to use a urban and homeowner soil sample information form. And so this is a screenshot of what that form looks like uh, every year it gets updated. So if you print two off uh, from and then this year and you don't, we wait till January, make sure that you go get that new updated form because pricing changes happen and are on the upside or downside of that, or they're looking for new information from, from you to be a, to give you a more educated uh, opportunity to do better for your plants. Uh, just, it, it always changes every year, but um, you see on the top of this form, very important for them to have all your contact information, uh, where that sample was uh, collected. Uh, email is very important because now they are, if you want a paper copy mailed to you, uh, you actually have to pay a little money for the postage for it to get to you, but they'll email it to you for free. And I've gotten them emailed directly to me and you don't have to wait three days. It take, basically takes about three days out of the wait for you trying to get those actual samples, the results from your sample back. So uh, very important. Um, but if you see, do not send cash uh, on that form. Uh, check or money order works well, or there's a way that you can pay through the Aggie marketplace. A little more difficult like that, but, uh, but you know, check or money order is typically uh, one of the better ways to go. A little faster that way, but whatever uh, whatever suits your boat the best, uh, that's what I tell you to, to do. And so when you're thinking about taking a soil sample, we need to think about what information do I really need to fill out on this long form? And so this is below what you just saw on that actual form. And so this is still part of that same form. Um, things we need to consider, 
we need to consider our square our square footage of the area we're actually working with. Now, maybe not you don't have to get a hundred percent accurate, but be very close, right? Just uh, if you want to go step it out, and if you figure every step is three feet and do you know length times width, that tells us our square footage of that area because they're going to make a recommendation to you on how much nutrients you need to put down. And we'll talk about that a little bit here later. They want to know the last time you fertilized it, because if you fertilize five days before you took the sample, all the fertilized may not be realized in that sample yet. So they would be expecting more fertilized to show up because it hadn't been processed and synthesized for that to make it available to the plant yet. Then they would like to know the what you previously used as fertilizers. And so if you, um, they want to know the type of fertilizer, and we'll talk about that, but maybe you used an organic fertilizer. So you used mushroom compost if you had that available to you, or you got some compost or organic fertilizers from uh, your local store. They just want to know that because that changes the, the recommendation they make to you as a homeowner or, or property manager. And then they want to know what you're actually growing. Um, and so if you look down in that square in the bottom of the screen, that tells us pretty much they they have it broke down into those. So uh, like I was giving you an example of turf grasses, uh, they have common Bermuda grass or hybrid Bermuda grass. Those two take two totally different amounts of nitrogen. Now, if you don't know, what you have, I would say, uh, if you want to go on the low side, do the common. Or if you want to, if you think you have a hybrid uh, Bermuda grass, uh, 419, Celebrity, Giant Bermuda, uh, or some of the variety names of those, feel free to go ahead and put that hybrid Bermuda grass. Or if you want to see that Bermuda grass really grow well, uh, even if it's common, uh, we can put, uh, we can still use hybrid. And basically, they're going to, tell you that you probably need to put a little more nitrogen out there uh, for those uh, hybrid Bermuda grasses. Or if we're using St. Augustine or buffalo grass or centipede grass, and buffalo grass is one of those that we can see in our local area right here around Colleen because that was kind of one of the native grasses that were on the landscape whenever this, prop this piece of the country was, uh, was put into civilization. Uh, that's what the buffalo had when they were grazing through this part of the world a lot of times on a lot of our limestone hills. Uh, but also if you're looking at, uh, you're putting flowers or you're looking at a vegetable garden, they, they want to know that so they can do the best job to be able to offer the best information for you for your property. And so, or maybe you have a small orchard uh, with some pecan trees or fruit trees all those take different, uh, they go into different algorithms that help us figure out how much we actually need. And, and that algorithm is tried and true. Um, had a lot of success using this system right here. And so on the bottom of that form, this is the bottom of that form. I just kind of screenshotted it, made it a little bit bigger for everybody, is routine analysis. Is basically, this is all the tests you can take, okay? They range from $12, to eighty-eight dollars, um, I would tell most homeowners or property managers always start with that routine analysis. Okay, and that's twelve bucks a sample. Uh, unless you think you're having another nutrient problem, that routine analysis, that that analysis number one, is by far probably your best bang for your buck because it gets a lot of the big ones out uh, that tells you exactly what you need to know. Um, unless you're having other problems, I would say consult an agronomist or uh, your county extension agent or email me and, and kind of help you. But I, I say that routine analysis can do wonders. Um, a lot of these other ones are really for like large row crop settings. Um, it's because the same, they tell you the same exact thing on row crop uh, or large agronomic areas. They tell you the same thing and the sample costs the exact same thing. So farmers don't get a break. Y'all are getting the same thing that a farmer would get and tells you the exact same thing. And that routine analysis is a, is a pretty dang good one in my opinion.
And so what, do, what am I actually going to get out of that? And so, or before we do, before we go into that, we need to think about what will we learn from that test? We'll think about this soil sample as a dipstick to your car's oil. We are literally, and I stole that, that saying from Dr. Larry Redman at Texas A&M, and it's the best one I've ever heard. When you pull, when you check the oil in your car, you pull that dipstick out, and it tells you how much oil is in your car's motor or truck's motor. Doesn't matter. Tractor, lawnmower, doesn't matter. All the same. Well, when we do that, we know how much to add to it to fix a problem. Uh, we're not worried about changing things out, but we're worried about adding two in this situation. And so when we send that soil sample off, that soil sample, that results tell us that's what we need. Just like it'll tell you if there's enough or not enough, or there's too much of one thing, uh, it, it really just gives us a, a baseline and a way to start working towards being a better uh, plant manager or agronomist out there on the landscape. So just think about it like that. And, and now we can't test our soil uh, at a high level of accuracy by just pulling it out and looking at it, right? We can't be that good. I, I wish we were that good. We're not. We need to use a little more science. But let's look at what we'll learn from that test. Okay, so here's a, a report form uh, for for what I got here at the school's property in 2019. Um, it, it, it's set on a per acre scale. So if you do a, an urban landscape one, uh, it'll be on a per thousand square feet and we could equate that to it. We just have to do a little number crunching to get it there. But for the routine analysis, uh, the one that I typically recommend to a lot of folks is I would the biggest thing you're going to get is it's going to tell you your pH. Okay, now pH is very valuable for nutrients. Uh, right, our pH goes from basically uh, 0 to 14. 7 is neutral. We can be acidic or we can be uh, base, more base. And so whenever we know that, that tells us how much availability of nutrients there are. We have a lot of nutrients, uh, including all the ones that are listed on the screen that become available at certain pHs and they become unavailable to the plant at certain pHs. So if we're looking at the more acidotic side, so getting a little more, uh, getting closer to that one, uh, around that 5.5 pH level, we start seeing a lot of nutrients starting to drop off from availability to the plant. Doesn't mean they're not there, but because of the pH, they are not available to the plant. And so it becomes very important that we start trying to find ways to adjust that pH. And we can do that. Then they, they will make recommendations to you for how to adjust that pH to get it to where it needs to go. But one thing we need to remember about pH is for us to adjust pH, it takes us several months, no matter what product we use, to get it to where it needs to be. So we need to plan ahead. And that's why this presentation is so timely, because land managers, property managers, they're worried about this, what we're going to do in the spring. And so if we need to adjust our pH, we need to be thinking about that now, right? We, if we send a sample in today, right, we put it in the great snail mail. We put it in our postal service mail. It takes three days to get there. It may take the lab a week or two to get the results back to you because depending on how busy they are, and then it's going to take a few days uh, for them to finally analyze that and then ship it to you through email typically. And so then we get it back. And then we have to figure out what we're going to do, where we're going to source the materials from, uh, things like that. But pH is huge, and that has to do with the cation exchange rate, with nutrients and soil particles, uh, and, and it's it gets if, if you've taken chemistry with Dr. Salvato or organic chem, uh, that all makes sense to you. But chemistry ends up being a huge thing within our soil nutrients. But it's going to tell us how much nitrogen, how much phosphorus, how much potassium. Those are our three big ones. It's going to tell us 
And, that, and the reason they're highlighted in green, because those are our three most limiting nutrients that we ever see in a plant. Now, if we look at the, the ones that are listed in black below it, we see calcium, magnesium, sodium, sulfur, and those are kind of more of our micronutrients that are still used in a general amount of supply. But in some locations, you'll never have to add sulfur. You'll never have to add sodium. It's just naturally already there for whatever reason. And so that's why we don't worry about it. But the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, those are the three that we really pay attention to, uh, to as far as soil nutrients go. And so if you look at this soil test um, results right here, uh, and this is on the piece of property right next to the Hemingway building up at the, uh, up off of Clear Creek here at the college, you see our pH is about 7.8. So I'm pretty good on pH. It's not that big of a, I don't have that big of, of a pH issue. 99% of my nutrients are available to me. But then I look at my nitrates, which is our nitrogen. Uh, and it tells us a critical limit where there's too much or too little. And actually, we didn't have to add that much nitrogen there if we're starting to try to analyze it. Uh, look at our phosphorus. Uh, we need quite a bit of phosphorus there. It's pretty depleted out uh, for our root growth. And so we have to really uh, pay close attention to that. And it also tells us potassium. Uh, we don't need to add any potassium, right? N, P, and K, that last one is not necessarily much of our concern uh, in this fertilizer. Now, when you go to buy fertilizers, we'll talk about that in a, in a minute, is you may have to buy it anyway, unless you're buying it on a large bulk scale. Uh, we're talking on a 2,000 pound ton basis. We can do that as well, but most homeowners, land managers are going to buy them by the at the max 50 pound bag um, out there. So, but we'll talk about that going forward. Now, one thing that I want you to take note of is down here on the bottom, uh, because this was for a, graze, a grazing setting for the school's uh, cow calf operation that they have here. And it says apply an additional 70 pounds of nitrogen for each subsequent graze down. So that means for every time we graze it down to uh, an acceptable height, I need to add more fertilizer of just nitrogen. And so that's what you're going to get. They're going to give you that recommendation of I need to do X, Y, Z to help try to get the, the plant um, growth to where I need it to be. So if you're in a garden, uh, you say, hey, you know what? I want to be able to produce um, 30 pounds of tomatoes a week. Well, they can help you with that. They can say, well, you need to apply this nutrient, this nutrient, this nutrient. So they make those great recommendations for us uh, to help us be better agronomists. And, and at, it, at the end of the day, whether you're managing 100 acres, 1,000 acres, uh, the entire King Ranch, or you're managing your, your yard at your house, you are an agronomist. Because that's what you are studying. That's what you are trying to do, be better at and try to help your plants grow. Now, as I was alluding to earlier, we really learn a lot of the proper amounts of fertilizers we need to apply for our plants. Because I can tell you, I would expect fertilizers to go up even on a retail setting this year. Um, on a large scale, fertilizers are probably up double from last year. Uh, people are considering what not to put out this year because the cost is so high. Uh, it's it's going to be a limiting factor for a lot of our farmers and ranchers out there being able to do it. But as I said before, they'll make that recommendation. If you need to add extra after a harvest or if we need to, at a certain stage of that plant's development, we need to add, you know, once the tomato plant flowers and starts to bloom, we need to add so much nitrogen or phosphorus uh, to really get that, uh, get that, fruit set and to produce a high volume, high quality amount of fruit, well, then that's something we need to do and they'll make that recommendation to us. So what do we do with the results when we get that form back? Now, there are several things you can do. Um, every county in the state of Texas uh, and most counties across the entire U.S. have a county extension agent 
tied to it. Now, some states, uh, if you're from out of state, they're called county uh, extension educators. Um, but if you Google uh, whatever state you're in, extension service, you're probably going to find their land grant system university, which in Texas, that's Texas A&M, you're going to find a link to their website. And so those extension agents can help you uh, decipher that a little bit and say, what do I need? What do you really need to put out there? Now, if you're like me and you don't like to rely on a whole lot of people, you like to do it yourself or you can't sleep late at night, there are a great amount of online soil calculators that we enter in the data we have from we got back from there and it'll actually tell us how much to actually apply because if we go back and look at this form uh right here the soil analysis report it tells us 30 pounds of nitrogen per acre it tells us 60 pounds of phosphorus per acre well we can't go to the store and buy it like that we have to buy it in a blend in a mixed in a in a bag that's already pre-mixed uh, that we don't maybe, we don't get to dictate exactly what those numbers are. So we can actually take whatever we have available to us. So maybe you go through your big box store or wherever you frequent your garden centers and say, what do you have? We write those down and we use those online soil calculators to tell us how much we actually put down on a per thousand square feet basis. And then we can typically that's a granular uh, granulars are the little bitty pellets that you typically see. And so those little bitty pellets, we spread out, sling out and uh, fall on the ground. Then we need to put some water on them and make them go in the soil. So once we have all that, we're trying to figure out what fertilizer do I need? Now, this is a big question, right? You go, you go to any store, they have seven or eight different kinds of fertilizers. And what do we need to, what, which ones, what, what do they really mean? Well, Every bag of fertilizer, by law, will have uh, three numbers on them. You see the 21, 10, 10, and that's just an example that I pulled up. So the 21 means how much nitrogen, how many, what percent of nitrogen is in that bag. It, the green tells us phosphorus, what percent of phosphorus is in that bag. And then potassium, the blue number, tells us what percent of potassium's in there. Now, it'll never equate to 100. So don't think all those numbers need to add up to 100. It, it won't, it just won't. Um, but when we look at a, maybe this uh, generic label we see right here, XYZ brand, um, it tells us that that's the percentage that's in there. Okay, now, if you compare the three numbers that I put up there versus the three numbers that you see there, those are in a lot smaller numbers right? There's no phosphorus in it. There's uh, quite a bit of potassium in there and there's very little nitrogen. And so just depending on what your recommendations are, we try to find the fertilizer that is the most uh, unique to our need uh, without just obliterating one nutrient, without just putting out three times as much one nutrient than we'll, that we'll, we'll ever need in a lifetime on that on that specific plot of land. And so it's very, uh, very important for us to remember that going forward. And so those three numbers are basically a way for you to compare fertilizers and you can compare costs a little bit. Uh, I can tell you more than likely if that first number is really big, you're gonna pay a little bit more for it because nitrogen is by far our most uh, expensive nutrient whenever it comes to um, fertilizing our properties. Uh, phosphorus and potash or potassium is, is a thing. Uh, it's something we need to consider, but we put those out at so small amounts typically in our area. That's not the bulk of the bill. The bulk of the bill is going to be our nitrogen basis. And so with that being said, uh, if anybody has any questions, fire away. Um, I hope I wasn't sitting here just, uh, Born everybody. I uh, hope so. Hope people are still logged on. Uh, but I'll entertain any questions right now. And there's my email address. Uh, if you can't sleep one night and you say, "Hey, you know what? I got this question. Fire away." I'm not saying I'll know the answer, but I will. I'll direct you to the right spot that does. Luckily, I got a lot of phone numbers in my in my phone that I get to lean on pretty hard. 
to ask them questions. I'll, I'll do my best to find you an answer um, if you got it. But, but I appreciate the opportunity to come and visit with y'all. Any questions, I'd be happy to have them. Lee, did anybody have any questions uh, in the comments? Uh, there's no more questions in the Facebook comments. Okay. I have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, I started recently getting mushrooms in yep. one section of my yard. Should I panic at this point? <laughs> I would not because mushrooms are fungus, right? Uh, now, if you love mushrooms, I don't want to turn your belly to that, but mushrooms are opportunistic growers. They've just had the right, uh, the right fungi are available in the right conditions and they're growing. I don't typically get real fired up about uh, mushrooms growing. They just, they've had the right opportunity to bloom. That's about it. Okay, so it doesn't mean anything like too much water or I should go get um, fungus stuff from, you know, uh, the hardware. I, I wouldn't worry about that. Um, I mean, yes, those funguses do require quite a bit of moisture. Um, I might piddle around. Do I, at, you know, dig down in the soil? How deep is my soil moisture? Do I need, not need to put enough? Or so a lot of times, some of those funguses come in on. They already come in on like a mulch or a compost you use because if you're using a mushroom compost, there's a great possibility there could be some some fungi left over from that production process of mushrooms from a mushroom farm. So uh, you could have those come up, but it uh, it doesn't really throw a red big big red flag for me at least. Okay, that makes me feel better. Yes, ma'am. I I was like, oh, they're beautiful. Oh wait, <laughs> wait. <laughs> is is it gonna eat my garden now? Yep. yep. The one thing I would say, um, I am not a mushroom expert. Uh, if you do have those mushrooms growing, I wouldn't say just go chomping down on them. Some of them are edible. But I would not recommend that without proper um, proper knowledge, because some of those are could be very hazardous to your health. Very hazardous to your health. Yes, I definitely am not going to munch on anything that comes up in my yard. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> so, um, uh, and one other thing that you said that now is the time to uh, to go ahead and put down fertilizer, like how. How often do you recommend fertilizer just for your average yard? Uh, so for like in my yard setting, um, I have a hybrid Bermuda grass yard, uh, fairly new established, uh, it's within three years old. I typically fertilize twice a year um, and you can get away with just doing once a year. I do twice a year. Um, I basically take my application and split it in half. So take half of it in the spring and half of it in the fall. So I have a really deep dark green yard year round. Now, if you're not worried about that dark green color, one application is more than enough to be able to last the entire growing season. So uh, it kind of just depends on how, what level of uh, intensity of, of care you want to apply. Okay, thanks. And I also have another question. Um, okay. It's kind of specific. Um, I had to research crabgrass. Okay. Um, I never didn't have crabgrass before, but this last year I had crabgrass and I looked it up and it said, oh, you missed the boat. You should have put something down in the winter. Yep. <laughs> so is that true? Should I yeah. find crabgrass killer in the winter and put that down? Yes. And that's, and so a lot of times, in some of our fertilizers, we can actually get, uh, you've seen a, a big brand out there that says weed and feed. And so basically that has a herbicide attached to that fertilizer that when we, when we water that fertilizer in, get moisture and put that fertilizer in, that herbicide is going to take care of it on a pre-emergent basis, meaning before that plant comes out of the ground. In crabgrass, we don't have anything that we can spray over the top of it that works well once it's already germinated and out in its wonderful glory. We have to control crabgrass along with grass burrs are the best way to control those as well, pre-emergently. So before they come up, we basically they basically attack the seed when it goes to germinate. That product we use stops that seed from germinating anymore and it uh, you'll never see it. But that's, that, is, that is something we have to consider for 
we're in the fall going into the, you know, going into the fall winter, we need to be thinking about any problem uh, pest uh, weeds or pests that we have uh, going into the spring next year. Thanks. And, and I have one question. I notice when I do dig in the soil, I mm -hmm. hit rock after mm -hmm. about or shale or something really hard uh, yep. about maybe 12 inches in. Does that mean yeah. that that's the only soil I have usable is that like 12 inches and when the nutrients are depleted, I'm going to have a lot of trouble in my garden. Yes, uh, that's and because of where we're currently located here in Colleen, there is a large amount of limestone or caliche uh, underneath us. Uh, so in your case, you said you have about 12 inches of soil before we before you hit anything hard. And that's kind of a shelf. Um, and plants won't be able to grow very much deeper than that. And so that's going to hurt. That's going to determine some plant selection for you or how long plants live because plants are always wanting to go deeper, 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 deeper. And so, but that shelf is going to actually move nutrients off a little bit for you as well because anytime you water, water is going to go down, hit that limestone shelf, and it's going to go the path of least resistance. So it's going to run downhill. So Yes, uh, that's gonna that's gonna affect your fertilizers, and that's gonna affect uh, anything you put in there to grow. All right. Well, um, you know, I it's amazing every area that you know you you live. There's different problems, and <laughs> you know this one. I first hit the shovel, and it went uh, it yep. stopped. Um, what is underneath it? So oh, absolutely, so, so. absolutely, and. You know, people down in Beaumont, uh, they have a salinity problem. They have to worry about salts a whole bunch within their soils because they're right next to the ocean, right? Or right next to the Gulf. Um, where we're at, we have to worry about limestone and having too high a pH, where if you get around the Giddings, Lee County, uh, Brazos Valley, College Station area, they worry about having too acidic soil. So. It, if if you're used to moving around, um, I would be used to changing soil conditions because things they even do in the Midwest, Nebraska, Kansas, any of the I states or the Corn Belt, those farmers do things a lot different than farmers in our world and homeowners alike. So it uh, it's a moving target if you move around a little bit. Well, thank you so much, Professor Eric. You've given us a lot of information. You've given us a lot of resources. Um, you know, I I hope you guys, you know, took a lot of notes because I know I did. Um, uh, we really, truly appreciate you taking the time out of your day to come and talk with us. Um, guys, you know, definitely go ahead and contact him if you have more specific questions. So um, thank you for joining us today. Um, and before we go, guys, I want to give you guys a heads up tomorrow at the library. We have an in person event communication meets community. If you want to practice public speaking, come over here at noon and we are we basically it's a competition and we're going to have it every week in the month of November where you uh, have two minutes to convince the room of something whether it be a book you've read or a movie or something of a belief and your peers, other students will be judging who was most convincing and the one who is most convincing wins a prize. And that's going to happen every week in the month of November. Then on Wednesday, we have our business department, Professor Drake, Chester Drake. He is going to be talking to us about starting a business. So hope you guys join us. It'll be, um, that that one the how to start a business will be back on ctc's uh, facebook so oh and we've put in the comments that starting in 2022 our library events are going to be on our library website we put our library facebook not our library website our library facebook and we put the address there so that you guys you know can get in the habit of come on over to the library's Facebook and also our night sky tours for 2021 are on our library Facebook. So, um, so that was all I had to say. We hope you guys join us and um, thank you again, Professor Eric and 
we will see you around. Oh, and we have a really fun thing for 2022 with Professor Eric and his department. We're doing a seed swap. So that'll be a lot of fun at his greenhouse. Um, so definitely, you know, check out our events page. We're going to be putting in our events page. So thank you again, guys, and have an awesome day. And Professor Eric, you have an awesome day as well. Y'all too. Thank you. All right. So thank you guys and take us out. But Professor Eric, don't go away. <laughs> yep.